Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar. Uh, my name is Anya Long from Cystic, and I am joined by Alan Carson, co-founder of CloudSmith, and my colleague Dennis Maligan, uh, principal sales engineer with Cystic, who will take you through today's webinar. This webinar aims to address the challenges faced by DevOps teams and security teams and prioritizing and addressing vulnerabilities within your containerized environments. Before we dive in, if you have any questions at any point throughout today's session, please go ahead and send them to us via the Q&A box at the bottom right hand corner of the screen, and we will get to them at the end of the presentations. A recording of today's session will be shared with you after the event. With that, I would now like to hand you over to Alan to begin today's session. Hi there. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, let me just share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. So I just want to introduce you to um, to CloudSmith a little bit today and um, and and go through uh, about spotting vulnerabilities at rest. And I kind of want to underline rest um, within this presentation. Um, so just to give you a, a bit of an overview, who is CloudSmith? So CloudSmith is a fully management, fully managed artifact management platform. Um, it's secure, it's cloud native, and it's universal. Um, you know, ultimately, it's an artifact and container rep repository service. Um, we sit in the cloud, and it's built to be cloud native, and then therefore, uh, you know, fully uh, scalable, both sort of horizontally and and vertically. Um, we've twenty eight different formats, um, so it it ultimately encompasses all your artifacts um, in one single source of truth. Um, so we, we, you know, we like to build it for developers. Um, we're developers ourselves. We co-founded, I co-founded the company in order to do that. Um, and it was a, a need for uh, what was, what was really out there was a lot of on-prem software and a lot of um, inability to provide uh, functionality in and around sort of the software supply chain management, which I'll talk a little bit about, about today. We're headquartered in Belfast. Um, but we have like over 300 customers using the, the service today. So um, just a little bit about sort of the, the technology journey that we've, we've been on so far. So it was it was built for the cloud. So it was, you know, it was built very much to be um, the, the system that you need in order to sit between public repositories and you bringing uh, your artifacts and containers into your environment or your VPC. Um, so you know it's you know it's fully virtual um, in terms of the uh, the way that you interact with it, and, and ultimately you can store all your um, your artifacts there. It's global distribution as well. So that was the other thing we noticed that there was a lot of sort of on-prem, node-to-node um, communication, and we wanted to build. Um, something that had global distribution right out of the box. So as soon as you put your your asset in, you know, in Frankfurt, you can ultimately pull it out in San Francisco at a moment's at a moment's notice. Um, the universality part is kind of key in terms of like, you know, ultimately we'll be talking a little bit about you know containers today, but everything that goes into a container is also incredibly important, and you know we'll obviously get to that in terms of the the CVE side of things. Um, but all of those assets set, sorry, all of those assets can sit alongside your your containers. And then a big part of this is is always being up and always being available. So um, you want to make sure that you have access to all of the assets that you need at all times. So you know we're providing that um, availability layer for uh, for our customers. And then ultimately, this is all about. Um, you know, reducing your risk and control of dependencies, and um, and we'll get into it. we'll get into that in the next couple of slides. So, just just to give you, I just have, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but ultimately, just so that you understand dependencies in open source software, you know, in this little diagram, your software is the bit in blue. The dependencies that you pull in from open source are the sort of the dark blue, and then the dependencies and the dependencies of the dependencies are the the, the purple and orange and, and yellow dots. So ultimately, you know, you're doing one action 
um, and that leads to bringing in a lot of code that you don't know. Um, you don't know its provenance. You don't know where it's come from. Um, so with that becomes, how do you manage those vulnerabilities? Um, you know, what are the licenses in and around that open source software, which is something that we can help you with. And then ultimately just the availability of that software. And so that is what CloudSmith is, is built to do. Um, it's, it's about global infrastructure in order to distribute artifacts and containers to wherever you need it, whether it be internally to your development teams, you know, through your testing, staging, um, right through to production and whether that's, you know, um, in one region, many regions, even into your own sort of uh, on-prem uh, private clouds. Um, you know, we facilitate that. So we are physically taking the virtual asset from your developers and ultimately passing that through the chain until you get to, um, to production. And so I just want to sort of talk a little bit about some of the challenges that, that are faced um, in and around kind of vulnerabilities um, and, um, you know, and those open source uh, dependencies. Essentially, like this slide says, you know, the ground is moving um, beneath your feet. So something that you, you know, thought that you knew um, 10 minutes ago could be different um, right now. So, you know, as just because of the sheer size and nature of everything that is going on um, in the open source community and all of those packages, all of those contributors, you know, there's new versions, new dependencies, new CVEs being found all the time. Um, new con contributors and new functionality. So it's like, how do you wrestle all of those, you know, factors into uh, a solution where you are reducing your risk? And I have a couple of things that you can kind of do. So um, ultimately, you know, reduction of, of risk at rest is about observability and control. Um, and, 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 and essentially at each step. So, and these four things kind of all coexist in, in many ways. So isolation, promotion, policy management, and quarantine. So um, I'll kind of go through these um, individually, but essentially isolation is just protecting yourself from upstream changes, promotion, moving packages through environment, policy management, applying policies to flag vulnerabilities, and then quarantine, which actually gives you the ability to block any um, package or container um, that hasn't passed uh, your, your policy management. So isolation, um, if you Dennis might have something different to say, but I think if you take anything away from today's um, webinar is that you do not want to directly connect to public repositories. So um, ultimately, there's all of that open source software um, sitting out there. And, you know, the, the key thing is you, what you want to build to reduce your risk, what you want to build is, is provenance of those packages. You know, where did they come from? Who developed them? Um, you know, what is the latest and greatest version? What is the safest version? Um, all of that is stored um, in, you know, NPM, Maven Central, um, you know, and, and the subsequent ones for all the different formats. Um, you don't have control over those. Those are community-based um, uh, repositories. So in order to get control, you know, you need a tool that sits between you and, you know, the assets that you're generating and creating internally um, and all those public upstreams. So that's, a sec that's effectively what CloudSmith can do, is provide that um, layer. And the, the most important thing about that is you essentially get observability of every asset that gets pulled into, um, into your software pipeline or deployed on your server. Um, but you also get a little bit of control in and around it as well. And um, you know, we can talk about that too. Um, so yeah, isolation is vitally important. Um, you know, to keep you as safe as possible. It gives the control that you don't have back to you so that every asset that comes in is, is yours. 
And so, uh, you know, one of the one of the ways of doing this, and I think if you have spent any time looking at the salsa framework, you'll you'll see um, language in and around, uh, you know, how to manage the artifacts that you do bring in and the artifacts that you build. That's essentially you want to kind of atomically build them so that you only kind of build them once. You know, you know it's been signed, um, and you can then carry that artifact all the way through um, your pipeline. And so that reduces the number of changes that can uh, can actually happen on it and gives you a point where you know it was scanned at a certain point in time um, when it came into your um, when it came into your workflow. And ultimately that exact same asset is the same thing that you are transferring across each of the environments and ultimately into production. So it essentially reduces um, the risk that you that you can have. Um, yeah, so it, it essentially maintains the integrity. And so the other thing that um, that we have built into to CloudSmith to kind of help you um, to manage this is um, is a policy management engine, which essentially allows you to apply rules um, in and around the packages that come in or are uploaded um, into your CloudSmith um, environment. Um, it, we check for license compliance, um, so you can have a you know a, an allow and deny list of licenses that you're allowed, um, and then ultimately in terms of the CVEs. You can, uh, if it feels your policy for CVEs, ultimately it will essentially lock quarantine and not allow that package through. I think one one thing I wanted to point out here is sort of loose left and tight right. Um, that's to give you, if you sort of go um, back a, a step in terms of the, the slides here, you've got development, staging and production. I've sort of mean left being kind of your development um, and then production in the right. You want to tighten the risk um, or tighten the, you know, the, the risk management as you go further and further to, uh, to the right into production. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not, um, you want to make sure that your developers have enough freedom to be getting everything done. But at the same point, you want to build in checkpoints and understanding um, of what you, what is allowed in terms of license, because sometimes you're just building a POC and you just want to get something to work. You know, it's not, it's never going to see the light of day in production. And then there are other times where you have to be very tightly controlled all the way through. So it's about building in that management layer of uh, ultimately control, but making sure that you um, you know where where you're at. And then quarantine itself. Is, is just the ability to block a download. So you can do, you can um, scan uh, Docker containers and I think eight other different formats in CloudSmith at the minute. Um, we're expanding that all the time. Um, ultimately, both both types of asset can get um, can get quarantined that feel um, any of the, the the violations. You know, and within those would be around vulnerabilities versions, and of course. Um, license rules as well. And so, and that's about it for me. Ultimately, you know, it's important that you um, have observability and control at each step. You know, that's, you know, the isolation is vitally important, but then those promotion, policy management, and quarantine are important factors in terms of like how you deal with assets at rest. And yeah, so. I will say thank you and hand you over to Dennis, and then he will switch into what happens at runtime. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ellen. So let me share my screen. And then I'll continue with our topic. Is my screen visible so far? It is. Excellent. Thanks very much. So again, uh, thanks a lot for being here. Thanks a lot, Ellen for introduction as well as the explanation about uh, your solution. In this second part, we will be focusing on the spotting vulnerabilities at runtime. And before diving in, and I will, I have prepared already actually like a small demo to demonstrate this, how this looks like in real time. 
uh, I would like to tell a little bit about our company. So even for those of you who is not familiar with Sustic, probably you have worked already with solution, uh, which was created uh, or co-created by our founder, Loris uh, Degliani. As you can see, uh, he founded uh, Wireshark together with uh, Gerard Combs and uh, Wireshark became very popular after it was uh, forked from Ethereum. Actually, fun effect. Uh, the reason why Wireshark became Wireshark uh, with the name is that the Ethereum uh, name was uh, copyrighted by the uh, former employer of Gerard Combs at the time. And so then, so if you look at Wireshark, how Wireshark provided visibility into network, uh, into network. So the goal was then later in 2013, when Loris founded the, our company, Sustic, to provide the same visibility uh, into the infrastructure and actually containers. And at the same time, the same year, uh, Docker uh, was announced at the PyCon and uh, became very popular quite fast. But the challenge was uh, the visibility. How do we uh, detect what is running as a container? How do we... Um, um, monitor those, those containerized environments and later with the rise of, of Kubernetes, uh, you have um, basically multi, uh, let's say, uh, microservice architecture with lots of uh, dozens or even hundreds of Kubernetes clusters with dozens to hundreds of nodes. And you need to be able to understand where, is, where everything is running, how everything is performing, uh, understanding the architecture uh, behind, uh, behind this, uh, those microservice uh, applications. But I will be able to react to threats, uh, and this is where we have uh, found us in 2006 in our project Falco, which was either donated um, to the CNCF in October 2000, uh, 2018, uh, and is now at uh, incubating project maturity level. And before uh, continuing further, I would like to just to give a, a brief overview of what Susic Solution or Susic Secure is covering. So the full application lifecycle starting from, from build, uh, from source to run, as we say, but also going a little bit beyond. So we do focus ourselves, of course, on uh, code security if it comes to manifest scanning infrastructures of code. Uh, we will be focusing in our session today mostly on build uh, phase in terms of uh, uh, seeing the vulnerabilities in the runtime. Uh, and of course, we do provide runtime uh, protection, real life threat detection and response phase. And response uh, here is, is quite quite important because you need to be able to um, not only to kind of see what's happening in your environment from a security perspective, uh, which vulnerabilities do they have, uh, which um, attacks maybe uh, they're incoming, but you need to be able to protect uh, those uh, protect your environment from those attacks. And at the same time, kind of going to the prevention phase. At the same time, uh, the containers uh, are very short-lived. Uh, basically, from our, our cloud uh, annual cloud and containers report, we see that uh, most of the containers uh, are living uh, less than five minutes. And what happens if this, uh, let's say, container was compromised and disappeared? Uh, and even with the luck that you see that something was going on there, you need to be able to understand exactly from the forensic perspective what has happened there. And this is where Sustic comes uh, uh, with our functionality combined with Falco and our Sustic open source project uh, and gives you re really the possibility to go back in time and analyze what was happening here. But again, in it would be too, too much to talk about everything in detail. In today's phase, we're gonna be uh, focusing on vulnerability management and vulnerability management in, uh, during the runtime. So if we're talking about vulnerability management from our perspective, we're talking about Sustic Image Vision and Sustic Image Vision covers basically the build and the runtime phases. Um, with uh, the build phase, we basically be able to integrate with any CI CD environments available. Uh, we do support uh, in integrate as um, into the registries. So we are able to scan in, um, registries as well. Uh, and uh, of course, if we're coming more towards the runtime phase, uh, this is where the things start to get interesting for, for us. Uh, we are able to, uh, let's say, to block unscanned or non-compliant uh, images uh, to be deployed in your, from deployment in your environment, in your Kubernetes cluster using our admission controller. Uh, as I mentioned before, we are um, multi-cloud, multi-cluster capable. So for us, it doesn't matter what kind of flavor of Kubernetes you're using, be it OpenShift, vanilla Kubernetes or anything else, branch, etc. We are able to run as a cloud native workload everywhere. And with the main topic of our, our of interest of today's session, uh, we have the Node Analyzer. And Node Analyzer is responsible for scanning the images during the runtime. And uh, if it comes to 
the reason why, or like the question, why is it important to scan images during the runtime? Because they were scanned before, maybe they were scanned in the registry, during the CICD pipeline. The point is that once uh, I have scanned the image before, uh, let's say on a particular date, and I'm going to demonstrate this in a second, uh, the results, they're all tied to this artifact and to the date where the image was scanned, meaning that once the new vulnerability has been discovered, once the, once the CV database was updated, uh, we need to be able to understand what, uh, how affected, how am I affected by those new vulnerabilities? Uh, am I affected by log4j, for example? Or like, was I affected by log4j? Which workloads uh, um, are those which you need to be focusing on as a team uh, to respond to this this new threat? And at the same time, uh, even if having the possibility to detect uh, or like to scan vulnerabilities in containers during runtime, there's another challenge because you get a lot of of results coming from the way how containers are built with all the different layers and sometimes those are as you get as of course positives but sometimes you get just an overview of um of scan results where you have multiple cves and you're not really uh one is not really possible to focus on those vulnerabilities which are important for me which when they don't need to start do i start with a high critical uh, do i start with those which are exploitable etc cetera, etc cetera. and if there would be a possibility like a magical possibility to only detect the vulnerabilities which have been actively used by the container which has been built, then it would provide a very nice way to really limit down the scope to those vulnerabilities uh, which matters, kind of prioritize, prior, prioritizing um, the efforts on that what's, what's really dangerous for, for me, which needs to be fixed first. And if it comes to that, this is where SUSTIC can help you a lot. And for that reason, I would like to dive into the small demo talking about how Cystic solution is working. Let me jump over here. And we will be focusing again on vulnerabilities. So let me give you a quick example. So I'm gonna go directly into the runtime scan. And in the runtime scan, we can see that we have multiple workloads running in our demo environment. Uh, and as you can see there's, a, of course, as a full Kubernetes context available with the scope where this is running. So in my particular example, I would like to focus on this deployment because this is a kind of a, a joke deployment, which is very uh, exaggerating, as we will see in a second, uh, regarding the vulnerabilities. But the goal here is to kind of demonstrate the possibility of prioritization from or overflowing of the vulnerabilities to really uh, drilling down to what, what matters. So let me dive in to this particular workload. As you can see, it's running in our EKS cluster. Uh, in the security playground namespace, and this is our port which we're looking at. And as a matter of fact, as you can see this is uh, this has already 4,036 vulnerabilities. When we started this demo a couple of, of months ago, we had uh, I think like 3,200 something. And of course, every time we discover new, new, new vulnerabilities, the CV gets updated and the results are, are getting higher every time we demo this environment. And I would like now to see a kind of to demonstrate this uh, workload. Let's say I'm an application owner and I would like to understand when, where do I need to focus? So like looking at the traditional way of approaching where I need to focus to prioritize my efforts, I have the possibility to, um, let's say, limit down uh, the severity, for example. So I would like to go with severity equal or higher than high. Then we have already reduced our few from 4,000 something to 1,000 probably 1,500. Then, of course, I can only fix vulnerabilities, uh, which has a fix, right? So that's why we can select uh, as a fix. And now we're already looking at 1,270 and has exploit. So now from all together, from uh, uh, over 4,000 vulnerabilities, we are looking down the scope uh, of only 31 vulnerabilities in total, which I need to be focused on. I can get all the information I need if I'd like to understand what is happening here. I get full score. I will be displaying, I get displayed the date when the vulnerability was was uh, first uh, uh, disclosed. And of course, I get full score based on a CVSS score from different sources, like in this example from NVD, Reddit, and BoonDB. If I like, I can either go to that, uh, to that link and download an exploit for proof of concept or proof of vulnerability and see if uh, how easy is this uh, executable. But in this example, I would just like to go back 
and give you also another perspective from the content wise because I need to be fixing be able to fix those vulnerabilities let's say I'm the application owner again and I can switch back to content select again the same criteria so severity is high uh, has fixed and has exploited so now I'm looking down on uh, 46 packages which I need to be need to fix in my in my image to be secure but I would like now to understand what of those uh, 60, 46 packages or those uh, 32 vulnerabilities which, which we're looking at, which package do I need to focus on? What do I need to fix? And because of the way how we work, because of our agent deployment, uh, which is being deployed as a demon set in the Kubernetes cluster um, next to the node analyzer, which is responsible for uh, image scanning, container image scanning, for host vulnerability scanning, we do have, of course, also our Sustic agent, which is responsible for the runtime and threat detection. And of course, with the way how Sustic agent is working is uh, via eBPF prop, which we're deploying, and we do analyze the system calls which are happening uh, on each host. So basically, once you deploy the Sustic agent in your Kubernetes cluster, as a daemon Z, it runs on every node, analyzes the behavior of the applications, uh, creates uh, machine learning models, but also analyzes the system calls which are going uh, hand in hand together with, with the S bomb of the image if you're scanned. And we can then pinpoint to uh, vulnerabilities as demonstrated in the slide before, uh, which are being in use. And for that, I can just select the in use button. And from 46 packages, we are now looking actually at only one package, which I need to fix. And as you can see here, we have three exploits. Uh, we have the suggested fix available. And we can see that this uh, library, uh, libssl obviously, uh, is OS type because Sustic is not only uh, responsible for scanning the OS type related, but also we differentiate between Java, Golang, and uh, other different languages. So if I click again on this on this uh, package, I get my full description of those uh, vulnerabilities, which are fixable. And this gives me basically the focus on, on what I need uh, to work on to make my application very secure. But again, in this example, we were both looking at uh, at a scenario where I'm an application owner and I do have only one worker deployed. If you ask yourself, how would I react properly if I would have a wider and bigger scope of environment? So switching basically from dev to ops. And uh, now let's go back to this example. We have the log4j disclosed and I now need quickly uh, to understand wo where do I need to be fo focusing myself uh, so that we are not getting uh, um, uh, exploited by these vulnerabilities and this is where we have the same functionality available but on a wider scale basically you're just looking from a different different perspective on the same results and this is what we're calling reporting functionality so if i go to a reporting i'm just going to create a new report for you just to demonstrate uh, how it works um, we have a possibility to uh, go uh, scan basically again against hosts against workloads and against registries but in this particular scenario, scenario, I would like to focus myself on the runtime workloads, uh, meaning that every cluster which is protected by Sustic agent deployed, we do have this information about the images which are being running there, about the contents, basically through the SPOM, about the vulnerabilities. And now I would like to create a condition. And with condition, we offer quite, uh, kind of, to say, right, uh, um, selection. So in my particular example, I would just, uh, understand how ma how many vulnerabilities are fixable in my environment how many vulnerabilities are um, let's say starting from uh, better yeah, exploitable so let's go start with that so we're gonna select exploitable yes then we're gonna go with fix available yes then maybe we go with severity and select the same criteria as before equals or higher than high uh, and Let's say I just want to preview and demonstrate you what are the results. I could press the preview and then I get, oh, why is it? And I get full overview of the vulnerabilities here, which will be generated and then maybe even integrated into further solutions uh, like Splunk. Uh, and here, if I scroll to the very to the very right part, I will get actually as of the full scope where those applications are running or like those containers are running. I get again Kubernetes name, uh, um, the Kubernetes cluster name, Kubernetes namespace, etc. And of course, the image ID, the tag, uh, and the suggested fix. What I didn't demonstrate it yet or selected yet is actually a more interesting uh, approach where I can again go 
and select in use, yes. And this will now narrow down the complete scope of what I've just previewed for you. Uh, and will display only again the vulnerabilities which uh, which matters. And that's basically how Systic works. Uh, you can either select notifications or create notifications, which are not only notification in the traditional way, you just send an email or Slack channel, but you can either e integrate uh, different APIs, like via webhook, the famous webhook, of course, and then, but as you create uh, complex processes uh, behind that. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's a, a short overview of uh, Sustic uh, vulnerability management uh, and uh, vulnerabilities in use. Um, then uh, I would now stop my sharing and uh, hand over back to Anya. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Alan, for your presentation. So we have a number of questions in the q and I think what's best is that I give them to you guys and you can decide who will take what. Um, so well, they're, all, they're all security ones, so Dennis can take them all. <laughs> <laughs> and Alan, you can jump in with yeah. context on your side as well. Um, so do you think there can be vulnerabilities outside the usual cyber suspects? I think that's probably for both you guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think so. Um, I mean, I mean, ultimately, the vulnerabilities and CVs are the things that have been found. So there are lots that have not been found and, um, and addressed yet, and they can come in all shapes and sizes. So, yeah. So the next one is uh, from uh, Isto. Is it possible for insufficient data input validation could enable attacks, attacks like SQL injection allowing attackers to access sensitive information? Ellen, you want to take this one as well? Or? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, yeah. I mean, ultimately, if you don't have sufficient validation on, a, you know, a text box or text field, and um, that is a way to get SQL injection in. So, um, and it's incredible what they can do in terms of how they can tunnel in and get onto a server and, you know, get access. So, it's a, I guess it's important um, for your, you know, the architecture of what you're running on. Um, as well to be um, built and set up in such a way that you have, you know, ring fenced everything that you possibly can and, you know, the con connective tissue between um, servers and, um, and databases and all of those things are as tight as they possibly can be. But you are, you know, you are only as secure as your weakest link. So um, that's why you kind of need to have uh, everything, but yeah, like data input validation would be one of the first things. But I mean, if you're on the internet, um, uh, that would be one of the first things to to, to close off. Thank you. And maybe from from Sustic side, just to add, this is why it's important to to have uh, runtime uh, threat detection protection with response capabilities, where uh, you not only detect the the attack of your containerized like um, cloud um, application, but uh, as able to protect and respond properly to it. And this is where FICO comes in place and uh, with our Sysic Secure, which can help you here to protect your running applications. I think this is for Dennis, but you know, part of your demo, Dennis, is that can you confirm if this is for cloud environments and not on prem? Actually, it's for both. So uh, our solution uh, is uh, we do not really uh, differentiate for our, our solution. It's focused on uh, on-premise uh, running uh, Kubernetes clusters or, or, or clouds, like managed cloud Kubernetes, or anyway, Kubernetes clusters available in, uh, in, um, in the cloud providers. It's basically with the Sustic agent, which is uh, once it's being deployed, um, it sends the data connects to our SaaS backend uh, and scans the images so compare to exactly talking about my demo so basically what happens there the Sustic node analyzer is running part of the daemon set on your kubernetes uh, nodes be it on-premise or a managed kubernetes cluster in, uh, in, in the cloud will scan uh, the image once it detects a new image is being deployed uh, it asks the uh, backend say hey, i have a new image with this SSH, SSH, sha digest this is where our results are being tied to 
And then the cystic backend says, oh no, that's a new image actually, because tags are not really met, it doesn't matter for us for scan results, but for matching uh, metadata later. So then uh, our cystic node analyzer um, starts uh, created S bomb, and uh, once those, this S bomb is finished or created, it being sent uh, towards cystic backend, where it gets analyzed, uh, and matching on the policies which you have created, uh, but as of course on the CV data available. So once it has been scanned, you get your results, and actually it's happening quite fast. So I don't have yet uh, prepared a CLI demo, but you can just download the Cystic CLI, create a trial account and scan images as locally for your developers uh, on your Windows machine, for example, uh, or Linux, Mac, doesn't matter. And then you will see how, how fast this is happening. And so, so coming back to the answer, uh, it's for both for on-premise and, and cloud environments. Um, Cystic Agent, is it based on Falco? Cystic Agent, so since we are the creators of Falco, uh, we do have uh, components of Falco uh, embedded. And basically, you can say yes, uh, part of uh, Cystic Agent is Falco. Of course, we have a little bit more because if you compare open source Falco to, to our solution, that Falco is basically detecting the vulnerabilities uh, or detecting the threats based on system collectivity inside your Kubernetes uh, um, containerized workloads, uh, the hosts, of course. And uh, if it comes to uh, response, like how do you protect it, so like prevent maybe this attack, uh, or how do I log this, uh, how do I alert? This is the everything which needs to be done uh, separately. Susi comes as a kind of enterprise solution with all the necessary components, where we're not only being able to detect those runtime threats, but also properly respond to those or prevent those, alert the specific particular teams, create forensic dumps uh, if. Uh, for the containers which are not existing anymore, for example, but as a host as well, which also gives us the possibility to uh, detect such attacks like container escapes, right? So if something happened, and let's say uh, I have a managed Kubernetes cluster running in uh, in a cloud environment, um, the workload has been uh, downscaled uh, or a new sprint deployed, uh, and maybe at the same time, um, the cluster was resized with a new t-shirt size. Then, of course, all the information of the containers uh, and the hosts has disappeared. So I need to be able to understand, not only to understand that I was compromised, if I was compromised, I need to be able to really uh, have the forensic evidence of what's happening inside this, and this is where Cystic helps you. Great. Can we use Cystic Secure to scan web app for vulnerabilities? I mean, it depends how this question is meant, to be honest. Uh, I'm not a developer, to be honest. Uh, but let's say if you're using Cystic Secure uh, for scanning uh, the containers uh, at CICD uh, as a stage, uh, or, may, or at the same time during the runtime, we will detect the vulnerabilities, of course, which are, uh, which, which are known. For the unknown vulnerabilities, however, and this is again, we go towards the runtime security, we have our FICO uh, runtime trade detection and protection in place, which will then protect ISO from the unknowns. So that's, that's my answer to that. Okay. Um, for the SBAM mentioned currently, is there a way to export it from the platform? Uh, if the question is basically meant, how do I get this information back? Um, for every image which you scan, and this is, uh, for example, if you go with CICD integration, like command line scan, uh, if you scan an image, the SBOM is being created locally and can be analyzed. Uh, and uh, I'm quite sure since uh, we have completely open API, it is possible, should be possible to extract the data. Okay. Um, and in the initial slides, you've shown the runtime threat to tech part. How does Cystic protect running containers from known and unknown vulnerabilities oh yeah basically yeah it's kind of a combination of 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 the question uh, or like the answers i gave before so next to to our node analyzer we have the cystic agent which is running as part of demon z and cystic agent has the part with the functionality again with pico we we have we're working with our cncf community of course to create and update the FICO rules which are not only updated by us because FICO is really um let's say broadly spread across uh, across the globe uh, there are a lot of companies using it officially and unofficially to for the internal but as a official external solutions 
and we are able to detect based on system collectivity and our rules, which and our policies, which are based on those rules, that something is not going in the right direction. Let's say if uh, somebody is opening a terminal shell in my production productive environment, or attaching uh, to 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 port, uh, or maybe exploiting again lock for lock for J uh, reverse shell. Uh, this is where our runtime security or like runtime protection based on FICO will be able to detect this instantly. And we're talking about not about kind of oh look at that. 15 minutes ago, something happened. So it's like real-time detection and prevention at the same time. So based on this, as far as we see the system call is happening, uh, already the measures are starting, like kind of blocking the system call if you want uh, to prevent like kind of drift detection uh, or if you just based on standard policy, because our approach is to have this layered policy, layered security approach, uh, starting from bottom up, building on top of those. Okay. So. Um Stefan has quite a specific question, as noted from himself. Um, would it be possible to create a notification alert for in use um, plus has exploit vulnerability so you don't have to check stuff constantly? Yeah, that's the, yeah, absolutely. So this is the porting functionality which I was showing earlier. Um, you can narrow down the scope, not only kind of a global one, but uh, since uh, we ingest all the text labels from, from the Kubernetes and cloud environments, you could specify a scope which is based, let's say, in my production environment or like Kubernetes cluster running in this uh, in this availability zone, with, but only for this particular namespace. And then uh, with multiple notification channels, you can say, I would like to uh, alert the team of a Slack, I would like, or maybe team, Microsoft Teams, I would like to open a Jira ticket, maybe go to service line integration, and then the reports, the report, as a uh, to my SIM solution to Splunk for compliance reasons. And then I said, please execute this report on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. And then depending on that, you just uh, have all the information handy. Uh, the teams are notified. We have a full process already integrated how to respond properly from the DevSecOps perspective. And of course, with the SIM integration, you have all the information handy in case there's an audit something like that um do you think regulatory bodies bodies or governments could do more to foster secure software development uh yeah i mean i can, I can take that one um yeah i think so um i mean ultimately um i think it was two years ago now um it did bubble up to the white house and um and there was uh, uh you know a day where they spent talking about software supply chain security. And um, so, yeah, no, I think ultimately it really needs to start permeating into, um, you know, ISO like certifications and, um, and making sure that, you know, the the, the provenance of uh, open source um, comes through and can be checked in and along uh, the way of, um, when you're, you know, when you're bringing all of that software into your pipeline, so um, yeah, it, like it is a, it is a tricky one, and, you know, and it does require the community really to uh, to band together and, and help figure it out, um, and it'll not be solved by any one company either. I mean, ultimately, it's you know, it's a village of good citizens that will you know will will solve it. But um, yeah, I mean, there certainly needs to be more regulation around it. Great. Um, and I think we've kind of come to the end of our Q&A. Um, if anybody has, oh, there's one more. At, oh, thank you. Uh, I think it's coming through um, in terms of the content. So with that, I would like to thank both Alan and Dennis for their time today and for their presentations. As mentioned at the beginning of this um, webinar, we will be sharing a recording. Uh, in the coming days. Um, with that, please keep an eye out on CloudSmith and Sysdig's websites and social platforms for any of our upcoming events. Um, so we'll give you some time back in your day and thank you all for attending.